Welcome to building block number three. We are up to Shemais. Building block number three is all about learning the outline of the chronological events, the sequence of events in the story of Chumash. We're up to Shemais. Shemais has 40 chapters. We are marrying this particular building block with number six. Number six is memory systems. And so at the end of my brief description of each chapter, Using the pictures, we will quickly give a silly, funny story that associates that Perik with the information in that Perik. So, starting with Perik Aleph. In your picture, you'll see there are three parts to the picture. They represent the three decrees that Paro made in Perik Aleph of Shemais. Decree number one was labor. We're going to use the letter L for labor. The second decree was the birth of every boy, BBB, birth boy, every single one of them had to be killed. The third decree was drown, D for drown, LBD, L labor, B, birth, D, drown. We're going to first put them through hard labor. When that didn't work to stop the population growth of the Jewish people, he gave another decree to kill every boy at birth, that's B for boy, birth, and D, drown. So those are the three pictures of the three decrees in chapter one. What is our simon for chapter one? So it rhymes with gun or son. In this case, we're going to use a gun. It works better for the boys as well. Then imagine, you know, those pop guns where you pull the trigger of like a wooden gun and out comes a flag and it just unfolds as the flag shoots out of the gun. So you can see written on the flag, three decrees. L, B, D. One gun, three decrees. L, labor, B, birth for boy, D, drown. Peric base, chapter two, glue. In chapter two, you will see in this picture, you can actually see Batya finding the basket with Moshe Rabbeinu, baby Moshe Rabbeinu inside the basket. And you can see in the reeds on the other side of the River Nile, uh, Miriam hiding, watching to see what's happened to Moshe Rabbeinu. So as you know, the flow from chapter one into chapter two is very simple because the last decree, one gun, drown, you remember LBD? So in the D of drown, boys were thrown into the River Nile and Moshe Rabbeinu to save him, the mother put him in a basket, now being found by Batya and then given back to Moshe Rabbeinu's parents to wean him until he was ready to come back to the palace. And there he actually lived in the palace of Pare for 19 years. After 19 years, he stopped Das and Aviram from getting into a fight, which um, could have led to the death of one of them. And this is after he killed the Mitzri. All this is in chapter two glue, you remember? And in that court, he was convicted for murder of a Mitzri soldier. And instead of him being assassinated, the sword that was used to cut his neck, Haz Shalom, bounced back, killed the executioner. Moshe Bain ran away. This is still in chapter two. It's not depicted in the card, but I'm giving you the extras bonus. And Moshe Bain arrives in Midian, and eventually he marries one of the daughters of Yisrael, which is, of course, it's Sipira. And so all that is in chapter two. So for our association between the simon, glue, two glue, two glue, and the information in chapter two, we're going to make the following story where Moshe Rabbeinu is, imagine him being glued into the basket and Bacha couldn't pull him out because he's glued to the basket. She had to take the whole basket with him. And imagine him using, let's say, uh, a glue gun to fire at Dasan and Aviram who are getting into a fight to stop them fighting. So they're glued into position when he held up his hand to hit his brother-in-law. And Moshe Rabbeinu said, Rasha, lama takai ra'echa? Why are you hitting your friend? In this case, it was actually his brother-in-law. So just imagine you've got two glue. Moshe Rabbeinu glued into the basket and using a glue gun to stop Das and Aviram getting into a worse fight. So that's chapter two. We're now ready for chapter three. Chapter three, as you know, rhymes with tree. In chapter three, the snare. That goes really nicely with the simonim. So at the snare, HaKadosh Baruch Hu reveals himself to Moshe Rabbeinu. This is in three, tree. At the snare, snare tree. That's just a very simple association. No special story there, because it works just perfectly. So in three, tree, HaKadosh Baruch Hu speaks to Moshe Rabbeinu and asks him, go to Parai and tell him to let Bnei Yisrael go. 
Moshe Benu begins a dialogue which actually lasts seven days and spills into chapter four, which we're going to get to in just a few seconds. So Moshe Benu, chapter three, snare. He's taking care of the flocks of Yisrael. He goes far into the Midbar in Midian and arrives at a mountain, eventually to be Har Sinai. Right now it's called Chayrev. And there, HaKadosh Baruch Hu in the snare reveals himself to Moshe Rabbeinu and has this dialogue. It goes on for seven days. Chapter four rhymes with door. Chapter four continues the dialogue. Moshe Rabbeinu is being persuaded by HaKadosh Baruch Hu to go to Parai and let the Bnei Israel go. Moshe Benu still argues back with counter-arguments. They're not going to believe me. Hashem has to send him signs, gives him two signs. You can see them on the picture here. You see the stick, the mate of Moshe Benu turning into a snare, into a snake and back again. And then the other sign is the tsaras. There's a third sign, which is really more of what's going to happen in the future, that water will turn to blood. That's going to be the first marker. But all this is described in chapter four, door. How are we going to remember it's in chapter four, door? The dialogue really went on and on and on. And at the end of chapter four, slash door, that's where Moshe Rabbeinu actually does go back to Mitzrayim and brings with him Tzipira and his son Eliezer. And what ends up happening is that in the silly story, I imagine Moshe Benu carrying Sipira on top of a door and walking all the way from Midian to Mitzrayim. So can you see that on the door? If you want to see a snake slithering up and down and turning into a stick, back to a snake, stick back to a snake, and it's sticking out of the door, you could do that as well. That might be a way to remember this door, snake, stick, and then Moshe Benu carrying them to Mitzrayim. Ready for chapter five. Chapter 5, Moshe Rabbeinu arrives in Mitzrayim and he goes to the palace of Paroi, as you will recall, with his brother Arunachayan. And there they make the request that Bnei Israel should be let go. In this picture, you'll see there's two parts to the picture. There's the hay or straw that Paroi says, go get the hay yourselves. It's really straw, but I'm using the word hay because hay and straw are interchangeable. And this is in chapter Hey, oh, so I'm not going to use five hive as we did in Bracious. We're going to use the letter hey because it's in Peric hey. And hey in English is straw. So you've got the command from Pare, go get the hay yourselves. From now on, we are not supplying the hay for the brick making. You have to get it yourself. Hey, what do you think this is? You want to leave Mitzrayim? No, you're not leaving Mitzrayim and go get the hay yourself. All in chapter, hey, very good. So that's the first part of the picture. The second part of the picture, you see the Yid now having to search for the hay themselves. And this is much more laborious than previously where it was provided for them. So actually the shibud, the slavery got worse now. All this is in chapter, hey. Moving to chapter six. So this is the last chapter in Parsha Shmois. Then we're going to Va'era. But before we get there, Chapter 6 is very brief and it spills into Parshas Va'era. So there's going to chapter 6 there as well. But we're going to explain this very briefly because it is very brief. Moshe Rabbeinu asks Hashem, why has it got worse ever since we've arrived in Mitzrayim? And Hashem tells him, don't worry, I'm going to bring about the Geula nevertheless. And you will see how I will deal with Parai. So in this picture, you can see the Shibud, the slavery continues. And at the top of the picture... You see this stick being held in the heavens, so to speak. And it's very similar to six sticks, as in Bracious, where Hashem warned about the corruption and destruction of mankind with the marble, which came in seven heaven. Over here, Hashem, so to speak, is warning, don't worry, Moshe Benu, you will see what I'm going to do to Paroi and Mitzrayim. So it's a stick warning, you're going to see what I'm going to do to Paroi and Mitzrayim. It's a very short chapter. Chapter Six now continues in Parshas Va'era. So we're in Parshas Va'era, and there are three pictures in this picture in chapter six. Rhymes with sticks. In chapter six, there are three parts. The first picture depicts four cups of wine. On each cup of wine, you'll see a, a word. Hoisesi, v'hitsalti, v'gaalti, v'lekachti. Those are the four words of Geula, the four terms of redemption, of saving us, which are mentioned in chapter six. So you've got four cups of wine, which as you know on Lel Pesach, we drink the wine from four cups based on those four words. So in the second part of this picture, you see a stick, six sticks, and written on it is Kal V'chaimah. This reminds you of the next part of this chapter, where Moshe Benu is asked by HaKadosh Baruch Hu to go to Parai again, 
and tell him to let the Bnei Yisrael go. At this point, Moshe Rabbeinu says, Rabbein Shlolem, the Yidin are in worse situation since I've arrived. The slavery has got worse and they're not listening to me anymore because it didn't get better. So Kal Vahimer, if they're not listening, how much more so will Paro not listen? And then Akash Baruch Hu says, no, you still instruct Paro, I'm going to take them out. And the last part of the picture, which is the last part of the Perek, because the picture represents the Perek, you see the Toldois, the generations of Ruven, Shimon and Levi. So our simon for that is Rashal, Rashal, Ra, Ruven, Sh, Shimon, Le, Levi, Rashal. So you've got four cups of wine, you've got the stick with the Kalvahim on it, and you've got Rashal. So those are three parts of Perek Vav. So how do we remember that this is in six sticks? So chapter six sticks, I just imagine six sticks, and on four of them are balanced four cups of wine. Can you see four of the six sticks balancing a cup of wine? The fifth stick has a Kalvahim written on it, and the sixth stick has a family tree hanging from it of Rashal. Ruvain, Shimon, Levi. Six sticks. So that's already Parshas Va'era. Ready for chapter 7, Parshas Va'era. Chapter 7 rhymes with heaven. In chapter 7 you see three pictures again. In chapter 7, the first part you'll see Aaron Akoyan with his stick turning into a serpent, into a snake. So that's the first part. The second part is where the actual Makkah, the actual plague of Dham happens. So you can see the stick which was made of sapphire, that's sky blue. And you see that's why it's that color, hitting the river Nile, and as soon as it does, the water turned to blood. So that's actually depicting the actual Makkah itself, because there's one Makkah in chapter 6, and that's Makkah's dumb. And in the third picture, you see Moshe Rabbeinu giving a warning to Parai. What is that warning? So you look at the speech bubble, and there you will see the frogs. So it's a warning of Sfadea of the next Makkah if you don't let Bnei Yisrael go. So how are we going to remember in chapter 7 what happened? Oh, so I imagine that Aaron Akoyan throws his mata, his stick, high up into the heavens, and you see it disappear into the heavens and come back down from heaven, and it hits the Nile, and the Nile turns to blood. So did Pare listen? No. In chapter 8, you see the frogs. He didn't listen even though he asked Moshe Rabbeinu, please, I can't take this anymore. And Moshe Rabbeinu said, okay, what do you want? Uh, just daven, they should go. Uh, when do you want them to go? Tomorrow. And even though he kept the deadline, Moshe Rabbeinu had them go exactly at that moment the next day. Nevertheless, Pare still refused. And therefore came the Kinim. Kinim Elias. Kinim entered inside the actual bodies of the... Mitzrim. And that's why they could not get them out. No matter how much they scratched, it didn't help because it was inside the skin. So they really suffered terribly from that. And still Paro did not let us go. And therefore came the third Maka. So you've got three Makos here. Arav is wild animals. Wild animals came from all over. And still Paro did not let us go. So these are three Makos in chapter 8, rhymes with gate. How will we remember that these three Makos took place in chapter 8? So in my association of the simon gate to the information in chapter gate 8. What I see in my mind is the Sfardea coming out from the Nile. I see the Pare's soldiers and watch guards beating it with their weapons and each time they hit it, as the Medrash tells us, hundreds if not thousands of small Sfardeim came out from the mouth of this giant Sfardea and they all march to the gate of Paray's palace and marched right through it, smashed down the gate and I see following this, this giant Sfardea and all the other little ones, I see following millions of little lice crawling along the ground and then behind them I see all these wild animals licking up the lice. So that's just in my funny association of eight gate, I see the Sfardea come out the Nile, smash down the gate and followed by the lice who are being licked by the Arav, the wild animals. Ready for nine? Wine. Chapter nine, wine. In here you've got four pictures. As you notice, you follow the blue arrows to see the sequence of the pictures. That's pretty obvious, I assume. The first picture has Deva. You see the dead animals there? That depicts Deva. The animals died from this uh, pestilence, from this terrible epidemic where all the Egyptian livestock, all the animals of the Egyptians died. And Paris still refused. 
So the next came Shechin. Shechin was boils, and that was brought by these ashes which were thrown into the sky by Moshe Rabbeinu. And when they came down, there were boils all over the Mitzrim and their animals. So you see in the next picture, the Mitzri has got all these red spots on him, and his cow has all these red spots, all these boils. And then the last Makkah, there are three Makkahs in chapter 9, wine, is Barat. So you see these hailstones coming down. As you can see, they're covered with a blue color, and inside is both red and orange, uh, red and yellow, and yellow on the outside. This is to depict the fact that the bara were slightly larger than the size of your head. They were very large, about six tfachim in diameter, and they would come flying down from Shemaim and smash down the Mitzrim and the trees, anything in its path. These hailstones were made out of solid ice and fire, something that's impossible for two items that are so opposite to coexist, and that was part of the nace. So Hashem made this Barad come down and destroy the Mitzrim who were in its path and any of their animals, livestock that was left outside. These are the three Makkahs in chapter 9 wine. How do I remember these three items in chapter 9 wine? So I imagine these animals dying from wine stains. You see these blotches of wine all over the animal and they're dying from it. And the only way they would actually recover from it is if hailstones would come down and knock off that entire limb where the wine patch was. So it actually killed all the animals in the process, but at least they were cured from the shechin. So that's just my funny association. So there are three makais. You've got deve, which is this terrible disease that killed the animals. And then you've got shechin, terrible spots of boils that grew on the skin of every Mitzri and their animals. And thirdly, Barad. All this in nine wine. Wine, nine patches of wine. Chapter 10. So 10 goes with toes, not because it rhymes. We've switched now to the more sophisticated system where the English letters represent numerical value. So T, you remember, is one. O and E in the word toes are both vowels and they have no meaning whatsoever. And then the last letter in the word toes is S. S is zero. So T and S, that's one and zero, that's ten. So in chapter 10 toes, you can see there are two pictures here. One is of the locusts, and then you've got Chayshech. So Arbe is locusts, and Chayshech is darkness. So how am I going to remember that there are two Makais in chapter 10 toes? And the answer is, so I imagine that the Arbe, the grasshoppers, locusts, were, as the Medrash in Medrash HaGadol tells us, they had wingspans of 11 feet and their bodies were four feet long. They had venomous snake tongues, which had venomous poison at the end of the tongues. And they also had horns similar to that of elephants. And they had teeth similar to that of tigers. These were not ordinary arbe. These were not ordinary locusts. These were giant locusts that had all these different parts to them that were treacherous and dangerous, the poisonous tongue, the horns. And what ended up happening is in this actual maka, they would pierce the eyes out of the Mitzrim. So in my funny story, I imagine the locust coming and taking out the eyes of the Mitzrim and then the Mitzrim going, Duh, who turned the lights out? And they're banging their toes into the walls and falling down from banging their toes out, and their toes are really getting badly damaged because their eyes have been blinded, they can't see where they're going. So in 10 toes, I see all 10 toes really badly bruised up, every single mitzri, and that's because they were blinded by the locusts, which actually did happen, and that reminds me, blinding, oh, that reminds me of Makas Choshech. So Arbe Choshech, Harbe Arbe, a lot of locusts, a lot of darkness. So those two plagues took place in chapter 10, Toes. Very good. In chapter 11, date, that's the simon you'll remember for 11. In chapter 11, there's the warning from Moshe Benu to Paray of Makas Becheris, death of the firstborn. This is just one more plague and then Para will let you go, says Hashem. So Moshe Rabbeinu instructs all Klal Yisrael to borrow expensive clothing and gold and silver and jewelry from their Mitzri neighbors. And he tells Paray, about midnight, about midnight, 
there's going to be this market that will kill every single one of your firstborn, including your firstborn child, Pare. Pare still refuses. What a nincompoop. You look at the picture and you'll see how is this depicted in the picture. So Moshe Benu does not look happy. He's pointing at a clock and you see the clock is pretty much at midnight. Pare doesn't look happy because he's hearing this warning where Moshe Benu is pointing at the clock about midnight. Marcus Becheris is coming. Watch out. Pare still doesn't let the Jews go. So what's the story for date, by the way? Oh yeah, got to give you the story for date. Forgot about that. Story for date in chapter 11. So we said in chapter 11, Moshe Rabbeinu was giving a warning of Makas Bechairus. So how are you going to remember that's in date? So I imagine a clock made of dates. And how do you see a clock made of dates? Well, it's quite simple. I see the face of the clock in a normal fashion and the hands in a normal fashion. But in place of all the numbers, I see dates. And I see the clock hands pointing towards midnight. And I see surrounded by dates and I also see underneath it I see gold and silver hanging from the clock. Why do you see gold and silver hanging from a date clock? Well the dates remind me that's in chapter 11 and the gold and silver is to remind me that Moshe Benu not only warned Parai that there's going to be Marcus Bukhairis in this chapter but also he asked the Bnei Israel borrow lots of gold and silver if you remember the jewelry and expensive clothing from your Mitzri neighbors, because soon I'm taking you out of Mitzrayim. Hold on for chapter 12. That is Pasha Spoy. But let's do a quick review. One gun, Pasha Shmois. What happened over there? Oh yeah, the gun pulled out, the trick that came out, the flag. What was on the flag? LBD. Oh, what does L stand for? Oh, labor. B, birth. Good. D, drown. Very good. Two glue. What happened in two glue? Oh, the Moshe Benu was glued into the basket. Oh, he had a glue gun and he squirted glue at Dasan Aviram so they wouldn't get into a physical fight. Very good. He ran away, came to Midjan. And chapter three tree, what happened over there? Oh, yeah, he was uh, with his flocks in the Midbar. Midjan came to a mountain and the snare. Oh, tree, snare. Yeah, yeah, Hashem spoke to Moshe Benu in the snare and told him to go back to Mitzrayim. How long was he there, by the way? Oh, seven days. That's a long conversation of dialogue, back and forth, back and forth, trying to get out of this incredible mission. But Moshe Benu acquiesced in the end, he agreed to go. And in chapter four door, the dialogue continued. But do you remember who he brought back to Mitzrayim? Oh, he brought back Sipira. Eliezer was uh, born. And chapter five, over here, we didn't rhyme it with Hive. That's in Barishis. We'll use it later on in Vayikra and Bamidba. But what happened in chapter five? Uh, the letter, hey, 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 very good. So Para said, hey, what do you want? <laughs> I'm going to let the Jews go. You've got to be out of your minds. From now on, you go get the hay yourselves in chapter hay. Very good. Six sticks. Uh, six sticks. Oh, there's two six sticks. Well, the end of Parsha Shmois had sticks. Oh, yeah, that was Hashem warning with a stick that you're going to see what I'm going to do to destroy the Mitzrim. Moving into Parsha Svaera continues chapter six sticks. What was going on there? Oh, you had six sticks. Four of them had what? Oh yeah, four had cups of wine with the different names of the Gula. Uh, the next stick, number five, had the Kalvachimah. What was the Kalvachimah? Well, if the Jewish people are not listening to me, how much more so? Para is not going to listen to me. Very good. And what was the sixth stick? Oh, there was a family tree. Rashal. Oh, what was Rashal? Reish, Ruvain, Shin, Shimon, Levi. Oh, very good. Rashal's Ruven, Shem, Levi. The told us of these three Shvatim. Now go into chapter 7. Oh, so what happened in 7 heaven? Oh yeah, the mat is thrown up to heaven, it comes back down and hits the Nile, turns to blood. Oh, very good. And um, what happened to 8 gate? 8 gate, oh yeah, the Tzfadeh came out, smashed down the gate, followed by the lice, the kinim, and the wild animals. Um, oh, that was Arayv. Oh, so it was uh, three Makos, Tzfadeh, kinim, and Arayv. Very good. That was in eight gate and you remembered it. Very good. What happened nine wine? Animals were dying and they had these red patches from the wine. That was Dever and Shechin. Oh yeah, the, the ashes came down and the boils, the boils, it was all red, oh, I like wine. Barad. Very good. How do you remember the Barad? So, oh, so only if the Barad hit the, the wine patches, then the animal was cured. But he died in the process. Very good. Okay. So what happened in ten toes? Ten toes. Oh yeah, I see. Uh, these Arbe, 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 lots of locusts coming and the, uh, s uh, gouring out the eyes of the Mitzrim, um, uh, biting off the toes. Oh, very good. Yeah, add that in. Um, and then the toes of the Mitzrim were banging into the walls because they were blinded. Also, uh, so it's uh, Makas, Arbe and Choyshech. Very good. I'm just giving you 
the, the thought process, but really uh, what ends up happening over here is you drop the simon. You're stuck only with what matters, which is where do I find this information? This information I know is in this parak. So you can go backwards and forwards with this. You could say what's in number nine and they'll say nine one and they'll bring out, oh yeah, there's three markers. That's Dever and then Shin and Barad. Oh, very good. And what happened in five hay? Five is hay. Oh yeah, go get the hay yourselves. Okay, what happened in six? Six sticks. Parshas by or Va'era? Oh, very good. Let's start with Parshas Va'era. Oh, in Parshas Va'era, four Lashonis of Geula and the Kalvahaima and the Rashal, uh, Reuven Shimon Levi, told us Reuven Shimon Levi. Very good. So you can go back and forth with the children and using the materials that we've got for the cards and the Yadids, the fortune tellers, the dice, the different string wraps for the memory system. Keep using all these materials in conjunction with what's going on in this Perek. So we'll throw the die, it lands on 11 and the kids have to say, oh, that's date and what's going on in date. Okay, very good. Now we're up to Parshas by Perek Yud Base. Your base is 12. 12 is tin. T is 1, N is 2. The I in the word tin doesn't count because it's a vowel. So T I N, tin is 12. In chapter 12, Parak Yud Base, Parshas Bai, you have a number of events taking place. The main one, of course, is Yitziyat Mitzrayim, but it starts off with Kiddush HaChaydesh, depicted by this moon shining in the first picture. Then the halachas of Korban Pesach. And then finally, Makas Bechairis itself. And then as you follow the blue arrow, you see 600,000 men between the age of 20 and 60 are counted as the population leaving Mitzrayim. The next picture shows the number 430, which the Torah lists as the total number of years from the birth of Yitzhak. And then the final picture depicts the Bnei Yisrael on this arrow going from Ramses, which was the capital of Mitzrayim, to Sukkot, which is right on the border with the desert. So you've got six pictures here depicting the events taking place in Perak Yud Base. So how are we going to connect this to Tin? So Tin, 12. I imagine the carbon Pesach being tinned. I see a lamb coming in a very large tin. I mean, it's got to be a very big tin to hold a lamb. And I see along the label around the tin, I see all the halachas. Instead of in a list of ingredients, I see all the different halachas that you'll find in chapter 10, chapter 12 of the carbon Pesach. Then I see the Mitzrim, after the Bnei Israel eat their Korban Pesach and have empty tins, I see the Mitzrim throwing out of their houses their dead firstborn children directly into the empty tins and being buried in those tins. So that's how I remember chapter 12 tin is the story of Korban Pesach and Marcus Bechairus. And then that leads into Klal Yisrael leaving Mitzrayim. So that's chapter 10. We're now ready for chapter 13. Still in Parshas Bay. Chapter 13, you'll see three pictures. You've got the picture of Pigeon Habachar, which means that for every firstborn Hamar donkey, it has to be switched for a lamb. The donkey is given to the Kayan. And you can be paida, you can redeem the donkey by giving the kayan a lamb, and now you get your firstborn donkey back. So, Pigeon Bechar Petachamur is in chapter 13. The next part that's discussed in chapter 13 is the mitzvah of telling your children every single Leil Pesach for the last 3,329 years. <laughs> that's a long time. We have been transmitting the story of Yitzhak Mitzrayim. Tell your child on that day that because of this, the carbon Pesach and the Matz and the Maro, which we're eating tonight, HaKadosh Baruch Hu took us out of Mitzrayim. So that mitzvah is depicted in this picture, the middle picture. And the third picture shows you Tefillin Shel Rosh, Tefillin Shel Yad, because it's discussing the mitzvah of Tefillin over there. So these are the three pictures that depict what's going on in chapter Yud Gimel which goes with Tami. Tami is 13. So how are we going to remember that in chapter Tami are these three items? So in my funny association, I imagine that inside the Tami of the Hamor, it's transparent, which means from the outside, you can see what's inside. And what's inside, I see the Hamor carrying 
all the gold, silver, and the belongings of Klal Yisrael um, inside the tummy. So that all you have to do is open up a little curtain, it's a transparent curtain, in the tummy of the Hamor, and you take out all the belongings that you're carrying out of Mitzrayim. So that reminds me of the mitzvah of Pijan Petah Hamor. I remember the Hamor that way. And then on top of the back of the Hamor is a saddle with lots of pairs of tefillin. I see the straps of the tefillin hanging out of the saddle. And this reminds me, oh yeah, the mitzvah of tefillin. And I see this Petah Hamor, this firstborn Hamor, arrive at my Lel Seder. <laughs> and he's got a transparent stomach with all this gold, silver and all the things he was carrying out of Mitzrayim, and also the tefillin straps sticking out because he's carrying lots of pairs of tefillin, and he's arriving at Lel Seder right in the middle of the story of Yitziat Mitzrayim. That's a, a great way to remember Yitziat Mitzrayim. On the night of Lel Seder, we bring a real Hamar. He's got this transparent tummy and tefillin sticking around off the back of the saddle. That's all in Tummy 13, chapter 13, Parshas Bai, Yitziat Mitzrayim. We now enter Parshas Beshalach. Beshalach continues Perak Yud Gimel. So Perak Yud Gimel is the same Simon Tami, but we're going to use a different story of association because the information is different in Perak Yud Gimel. In Perak Yud Gimel, Parshas Beshalach is the final exodus, Yitziat Mitzrayim, and Klal Yisrael leave Mitzrayim armed. They armed with weapons and they bring also with them the bones of Yosef Atzadik. And as they enter the desert, the desert has a pillar of a cloud depicted in these two pictures. The pillar of the cloud that they follow by day and then by night, the same cloud, that pillar turned to fire and lit up the night and they continued walking through the night as well. The very bottom of this picture, you will see a little strip that tells you with the red arrow two places where they came from, where they're going to. They came from Sukhois and they're moving to a place called Etam, that was inside the desert. Sukhais was actually right on the border of the Midbar. Some say it was the name of a place. Others say it doesn't mean a name of a place. It's actually where the Anania covered. The clouds of glory were waiting for us, and it's a lashna of schach, because schach is really a roof. So the Anania covered were the roof for Klal Yisrael as we traveled through the Midbar. So for my funny story, I imagine Klal Yisrael walking through the Midbar, but behind them are hundreds of thousands of Mitzrim who were converted. They're the Eruv Rav, who came along with us. Just felt they'd got to be lower than Klal Yisrael, so I see them crawling on their tummy. So I see Yitzhak Mitzrayim, the Eruv Rav, coming with them. And I also see in my uh, imagination, of course, the coffin of Yosef Atzadik. And from one end of the coffin, I see a pillar of cloud goes vertically up into the sky. And at the other end of the coffin, I see a vertical pillar of fire. So that reminds me that Klal Yisrael, when they came out of Mitzrayim, they were followed by millions of Mitzrim on their tummy, because that was the Erev Rav. And I see the coffin of Yosef Tzadik with the pillars coming out on both sides. We're now ready to continue Pashas B'Shalach. What happens next, as you know, is in chapter 14, Tyre, Klal Yisrael arrive at Pi Hachirois. And that's where the Yamsuf splits and Klal Yisrael crosses over and the Mitzrim drowned. So in this picture you can see the Yamsuf splitting and the Mitzrim drowning. How are we going to remember this? So in our funny association, I imagine a giant tire, tire is 14, a giant tire splitting the sea and the tires of the Mitzri chariots burning and melting. If you want a tire to actually go through the water and split it. Of course, that's not what happened. It was split by the wind of a Kodesh Baruch Hu. Uh, but it's in the funny tire to remember tire 14. Oh yeah, Kriyas Yamsuf, the splitting of the sea. In chapter 15, Klal Yisrael arrives on the other side of the Yamsuf and seeing that the Mitzrim truly did drown, they sing Az Yashir. Moshe Benu leads the song of Az Yashir and Klal Yisrael sing it together. So in the first picture you see Az Yashir, Moshe Benu singing it, Klal Yisrael respond to it. The second picture shows that they arrived at a place called Mara. Mara comes from the word Maror, which means bitter, as in bitter herbs. The waters there were bitter, they were not drinkable. So Moshe Rabbeinu threw in a log that itself was bitter and Hashem made a nace that the bitter log made the bitter water sweet. So that's in the second picture. And the third picture is they arrived at a place called Elim, where there were 70 palm trees for each of the members of the Sanhedrin, and 12 fountains of water 
for the 12 Shvatim. So these three pictures took place in Tale. How will I remember? It's in Tale, chapter 15. Tale is 15. So I imagine Moshe Benu using a tale as a conductor would go like this. As Yashir Moshe, Uvene Yisrael. So I could see a tail being used as a conductor, uses a stick. Here it's being used as a tail. So I remember that to remind me of Az Yashir. And then I would throw the tail back behind me and it would land in water, sweeten it. And then out of the water would spring 70 palm trees and 12 fountains which go springing out of the water. All in chapter tail 15. Chapter 16, still in Parshas Bashalach. You'll see the strip at the bottom tells us they went from Elim, where the springs came out of the water. Remember the simon for that? And the 70 palm trees. So they went from Elim to a place called Midbar Sin. In Midbar Sin, the Jewish people complain for meat and bread. So in this picture, you can see the speech bubble of the Hamoinam screaming, we want meat and bread. You can see the icons for the meat and for the bread. And Moshe Benu is responding to them. He tells them, why are you complaining against Aaron and myself, you're really only complaining against the Kaddish Baruch Hu. Uh, so they, they're begging for bread. Hashem says, I'm going to send them man. So in the second picture, you see a jar containing the man. The jar was actually made of glass and was kept in the Mishkan for Jews to see that Kaddish Baruch Hu took care of us with this miraculous man coming down from Shemaim every single day for nearly 40 years. So this is something that actually was hidden by Moshe Benu, and when Moshiach comes, it will return to us. So how will we remember all this took place in chapter 16, dish, dish is 16. I imagine the Yidden going out with dishes in their hands and the man landing on the dishes. Of course, that's not what happened because it really landed on the dew, which was the tal that was already on the ground. And then came the man, and then another layer of dew to keep it all clean. That's why we have a hala cloth on top of the challah, which is on top of a Shabbos tablecloth. So the tablecloth is actually meant as the first level of Jew. The challah represents the man, and then the challah cloth represents the second layer of Jew that Hashem sent to keep the man clean and pure. So all this is in chapter Dish that we find in Parshas Bashalach, chapter 16. Very good. Okay, chapter 17, Parshas Bashalach, Perak Yud Zayin. In this parak, you've got three items. Klal Yisrael complained for water. Moshe Benu hits a rock on the instruction of a Kadosh Baruch Hu, not to be confused with chapter 20, nose in Bamidba. We'll get to that later. But in chapter 17, Moshe Benu hits the rock on instruction of a Kadosh Baruch Hu. Water comes spurting out. And then, because we complained, where is Hashem? We need water. What ended up happening is Amalek attacked Klal Yisrael. So these are the three main items in chapter Yud Zayin, Perak 17. How do we remember this is in chapter 17? So I imagine chapter 17, dock. Remember dock as in when you dock a boat. I imagine Klal Yisrael are on this dock and I imagine them complaining for water and then Amalek comes out of the water and then attacks Klal Yisrael. So that's how I remember what's going on in chapter 17. We're now ready for chapter 18. Chapter 18, Parshas Yisrael, Perak Yud Ches. There are three things happening in this card. The first one is Yisrael converts. Number two, he joins Klal Yisrael, where you see we're lining up, asking questions to Moshe Benu, who's telling us the Tersh Balpeh on the Tersh Bechtav, and answering all our questions. And the third picture in this Perak shows us the instruction that Yisrael was suggesting that Moshe Rabbeinu, instead of taking on all Klal Yisrael's one long line, asking questions one after the other, he should delegate and have every single 10 Jews have one Rebbe, one Dayan, every 50 have their own Dayan, every 100 their own, and every 1,000. So you'd have one leader above 1,000 Jews, another leader for every 100, another leader for every 50, another leader for every 10. And if the Rebbe of the 10 gets a kasha that he can't answer, he'll go to the Rebbe of the 50s. If the Rebbe of the 50 can't answer the question, he'll go to the Rebbe of 100. And if he can't, he'll go to the Rebbe of 1000. And if he can't, then he'll go to Moshe Rabbeinu. So this way, it will help Moshe Rabbeinu not to have to get all burnt out. So it was a great idea, delegation. These are the three parts of Perak Yudches, chapter Dove, as in Dove.
tweet, tweet, tweet type of a dove. So in my funny story, I see a dove flying over the machine of Klal Yisrael and then releases from his claws Yisrael with his daughter Tzipara, the wife of Moshe Benu, and their two sons, and they come parachuting down into Machan Yisrael. So for me, that reminds me of all the different parts of Perak Yudches. Ready for Yutes. Yutes has a little strip at the bottom, tells us that we went from Rafidim to Midbar Sinai. We're getting really close to Mamar HaSinai. Chapter 19 is actually the precursor for chapter 20. Duh. Now, what I mean by that is that not that just chapter 19 comes before 20, but 20 is national revelation, the greatest event in world history. Oh, so 19 is all about preparation for Mamad Hasinai. That's what I meant. Okay, so in chapter 19, tub. In chapter 19, you see all Klal Yisrael jump into a massive mikveh. We are all being matahir ourselves in preparation for Mamad Hasinai. You can hear the thunder, the lightning, the blowing of the shofar. You see the fire above the mountain and the mountain is beginning to tremble. So all that is in chapter 19, Tub. How do we remember that's all in Tub? So in my funny association, I just imagine that in preparation for going to the mikveh, which is a natural lake in this particular case, Everyone has to remove anything that would be dirt or a chatzitsa, something that would be an interruption between their skin and the waters of the mikveh. And therefore, I see everyone taking baths in tubs in preparation for the mikveh, in preparation for Mamad HaSinai. Tub 19, we're in Pashas Yisrael. Now we go to chapter 20, Mamad HaSinai, the real thing. Torah is the way it should be. Yeah. So in chapter 20, we have Mamad Hasinai, the greatest event in world history, Matan Torah. This event is witnessed by approximately 3 million Jews. You can see lots of Yidden around the mountain. You see the flowers on the mountain. You see the fire and the cloud, the dark cloud and the flames that are going up from the mountain up to the Lev Shemayim, the heart of heaven, so to speak. So this is the story of Mamad HaSinai, where Kaddish Baruch Hu speaks to Klal Yisrael in front of three million witnesses. Greatest event in world history. Chapter 20, chapter Nose. How do we remember it's in Nose? So I imagine that the mountain has the shape of a nose. That's not unusual. And that through the nostrils, I can see fire coming out and I can hear the shofar blowing from the nostrils, and I see black cloud coming out of the nostrils. So can you see that all happening in nose? So Mamad Hasina chapter 20. We are now up to Parshas Mishpatim. Let's do a quick review. What happened in chapter 20? Oh, Mamad Hasina. Very good. How do you remember? Nose inverted with the nostrils everything. Okay, very good. What happened in chapter 19? Tub. Oh, preparation for Hasina. Very good. What happened in 18? Dove. Yisrael came to Machan Yisrael and he converted and he gave an Eitzah to Moshe Benu. Very good. Uh, what was his Eitzah? That every 10 Jews should have a Rebbe and every 50 and every 100 and every 1,000. Very good. What happened in 17? Dock. Oh, we were attacked by a Malik. What's your funny story? Oh, um, we were on a dock and we were complaining for water, which is kind of ridiculous when you're on a dock. There's lots of water all over the place. Uh, and then out from the water came flying. Amalek and attacked us on all sides. Coward. Um, and what happened in 16? Tish, 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 tish. Oh, uh, the man came down. Very good. And what happened in 15? Tail. Oh, uh, Az Yashir. We sang the Az Yashir at the Yamsuf. Very good. What happened in 10? Toes. Oh, that was the Maka of Arabe and Choshech. Very good. So you keep going back and forth, back and forth between all the different prakim. Uh, I would say every two or three parshas uh, do a very fast chazara and keep using the materials to keep the kids into the flow. Let's go back to mishpatim.